Welcome to a special edition of Life Talks today. Uh, we're we're going to be discussing the the repercussions, the fallout of the Dobbs case and the overturning of Roe versus Wade. I'm Ben. I'm here with Dan. We are two of the teaching pastors here at Life Fellowship Church here in Cornelius, North Carolina. And Dan, I know we we recorded a couple episodes, maybe a couple months ago about uh, actually, the, the was, potential of yeah, this. Yeah, it was right after the leak. We, we yeah. So, so but but now we're now we know what has been written. We know what the opinions are and we are now walking you know knee deep head deep into the reality of this decision where we are seeing that the 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 froth and the foment of yeah. you know, of certain <laughs> of certain people uh angry uh, mobs. I mean, I just recently heard heard a chance. You know, if Rose not safe, neither are you. I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. They're what actually we're writing hearing. that one on on Crisis Pregnancy Center doors, sidewalks, and walls and, all over the country. And there was a Crisis Pregnancy Center. I think a Christian Pregnancy Center out in Colorado that was uh, burned down or, yeah. or at least attacked this past weekend. So, a lot of things going on. And, and I I don't want to spend a lot of time on the necessarily on the legal issues. I want to spend more time on maybe maybe spend a little time on the legal issues and then more on the application. Okay, what what does this mean? How do we continue to move forward? So, um, Dan, just give me your thoughts on when it came down and when you read and heard the opinions that the justices ha- had written, what were your initial thoughts? Yeah, Roe versus Wade was decided when I was 12 years old. So mm-hmm. this has been most of my cognizant life, yeah. you know, where I was plugged in. This has been the defining political issue for people like me yeah. uh, of my entire lifetime. I cannot, I cannot uh, overstate the significance of this in terms of how how I functioned politically mm. uh, to, to, to the point where there are many times I was at absolute despair, um, in, including, you know, uh, even, you know, a lot of cynicism on my part when when Trump began appointing these Supreme Court justices because I'd watched Reagan appoint Sandra Day O'Connor. I had watched and, and uh, Anthony Kennedy. Mm. I had watched um, uh, Bush the first uh, do David Stephen Souter. Bri- and Bri- was, did he Bri- Bri- was, Bri- was a Democrat. OK, uh, but at, and, and then John Roberts, mm. who even. Even though he voted to support um, uh, the Mississippi law, let's make sure we understand, he did not vote. In fact, he voted to uphold Roe versus yes, Wade. Yeah. So Because originally you heard it was 6-3, but yeah. really it was, it was kind it of was like 5-3 like three three and 1, yeah, basically. It was, well, it was 6-3 on the Mississippi case, and it was 5-4 on the overturning of Roe versus okay. Wade. Okay. And, and so he continues to track toward the middle, uh, being more interested in his uh, historical uh, reputation than he is in the rule of law and principle yeah. of, of conservative values as an originalist. So yeah, this this was huge. I mean, I I can't tell you, you know, just the joy I had, and 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 it's a symbolic victory. It's 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 symbolic because Roe versus Wade was the you know the the placard chant, so to speak, for all these years. Um, it doesn't change all that much, but I think it. It at least marks a temporary shift, Mm -hmm. but it also creates an actual crisis in this country about Mm -hmm. what we're going to do with life. When are we going to define it as as valid and how far are we willing to go? And these are the questions that are now going to be moved down to a local level, to the state level, where the Constitution provides they should be. But – I don't think it's over there. I think there's another issue that has to be addressed by the court. I just don't know whether the court has the courage to address it or not. And that is whether or not we fundamentally have a right to life. And if we do, when does life begin? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's kind of what it's done is it's it's taken off the – um, the the right to abortion. Yes, and it's and it's, it's put, making us deal with the real things. The the real thing, like okay, not now because I have heard the arguments on on the left side saying, well, now um, it's taken away our our democratic you know opportunity, and, and really it's it's become more democratic because what we're saying is every people can elect representatives that to make laws to either um, codify mm-hmm. uh, abortion access or to codify right to life. And I think, I think that's really, um, I, what I see is states are going to get redder and bluer. Don't you, don't you see, sense that? Yeah. I I, I think that is happening. And I think the more that that happens, the greater the danger of maintaining a unified country, um, even practically, politically, you know, geographically Mm. comes. I don't know if it's in my lifetime or not, but I, I do think it can create a flashpoint at some point if we're Mm. not careful, Uh, particularly if they start, you know, economic, um, threats and following through on those between mm-hmm. states, that's going to cause a lot of conflict. Mess with somebody's pocketbook and they get upset. <laughs> but, um, the, the the thing, though, that I, I think that 
we need to be real careful of during this time is, first of all, the emotions are so high and emotions often lead us to irrational, irrationality. Mm -hmm. I think for most people right now on the pro-life side, uh, we want everybody to remember we're still here, but I'm not going to, I don't want to get overly engaged with all the emotion we're seeing on social yeah, media and yeah. the media. That'll die down and then you can have productive conversations, mm -hmm. but not until the emotion dies down. I, I think if you'll step back and look, you know, they always say, follow the science, follow the science. Well, unless it's convenient with inconvenient to, you know, what I want to do. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of logical arguments that stand firmly on the side of the pro-life argument. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we have to continue to make those. I think there's one thing that we backed away from doing that we were doing in the 80s and early 90s that I really, and I'm a little bit of a firebrand on this. <laughs> little bit. Really? Yeah. But I, <laughs> I think we need to introduce people again to the realities of abortion. Mm. Um, you know, for instance, I put a, a picture of an abortion on my Facebook several years ago mm. and media got tagged and taken down mm. uh, because it was considered to be too violent. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the reality. Yeah. I mean, the, the other stuff I see on Facebook is to me far more offensive and far, but no, this was, this is a political issue. And so they, they really censor it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's time for us, particularly when we're talking about late term abortions, partial birth abortions, these kind of things. These are human beings who can feel, respond, react, uh, recoil, um, and th they induce pain into them in order to terminate their lives. By every definition, it's infanticide. By every definition, and and by the way, the, the law, the the since Roe versus Wade was decided, the the period of viability continues to move closer and closer to right, the exactly. point of conception. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and it's That's, interesting if you follow the science. The science keeps showing yeah. earlier and earlier that life begins at much earlier stages. Yeah, and we all know. I mean. There is that point where life is real. Uh, mm -hmm. If we found a two-celled organism on Mars, uh, you know, through through one of our, uh, the, every headline would oh, say, man. "Life that found on Mars." Life on well, Mars, yeah, yeah. yes. So, and by the way, if somebody were to dare go up there and step on that life, they would absolutely lose their minds. Yeah, uh, that's the hypocrisy of the left. Absolutely slays me at times when you've got you know vegans and animal rights activists, you know, screaming loudly for the termination of, of, of human beings. <laughs> it, 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 but that's the emotion part, and so yeah. we've got to step back. We need to do with it scientifically. We need to deal with it biblically, but we also understand many of the opponents of life um, don't come from a biblical worldview and reject it outright. Um, so we have to make our arguments to them perhaps in a different way. Yeah, I think it's it's important that Christians in this moment really... I, I, I had a statement that I read to our church yesterday. Um, I really think it's important because most of us... I, I'm almost glad for the leaked... You yeah, know, I think that in some ways against it, them. It, it really did. Yeah. In some ways, it like kind of took some the, of the air out of it the took balloon. the teeth out of a lot of the reaction because I think people were expecting it. But I, you know, I said this yesterday, and I, and I think this is why I'm having such a hard time with this right now, is that I never thought this day would come, Dan. I mean, I never did. Yeah. And yet here we are. And so part of me is just kind of like, I feel like, is this real? Is this really happening? And I know that overturning road does not make abortion illegal. Again, it's it's frustrating when I see people on the left who are, you know, these these single single young white women living in these blue cities, you know, <laughs> yeah. screaming, I'm I you know, you're taking away my rights. I'm like, you you live in New York City. You have nothing to worry about. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but um which I think there's just so much misinformation going on right now. But but I I just almost I almost feel like what do I do with this? Yeah. And, and I think that it reminds me of how important okay Laws are. I'm. I'm thankful for the overturning of Roe versus Wade, but I said this yesterday, and I think it, it bears repeating. We need to understand that if people's if hearts are going to change, they change through a number of different ways. They change through relationship. They change through the exposure of truth. Um, and, and I think that it, we've got to understand that that the gospel changes hearts more than anything. And so. Learning how to dialogue instead of argue. Learning how to build relationships. Uh, I know we had jo we've had Josh Brom on our podcast a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I think he does a great great job with the one of the best one with of the, best. Uh, the Equal Rights Institute that he leads. He's a part of our church. Um, he has a lot of great stuff on on his on his website. But but I just think we need to get back to having conversation, more conversations, more building relationships, and more exposing to the truth. Because to me, it's like you, you just said it. Logic. Science, truth, every, it just seems like everything is on our side of mm -hmm. this issue. 
Um, we just have to we have to cut through the emotions and say, let's have a real dialogue about this. And I think if we if we know what we believe and know how to express what we believe, and we actually are intentional about building relationships with people who don't agree with us, I believe we can see a great movement of of change happen in the streets because the reality is. Abortions will still happen in certain states as long as people elect representatives and governors who say, hey, we want to we want to have abortion. And what you're seeing is the I said this earlier, the blues getting bluer, the reds getting redder. The blue states now, like you said, you know, California, I forget. I mean, they're or, literally Oregon, I mean, it's, yeah. it's becoming partial birth or right after birth yeah. murder at this point. And, and some of that is an overreaction. Um to, you know, the Mississippi law. And, and part of it is in, you know, I'm not trying to be crude, but it's flipping the middle finger at the pro-life group. Right. They have the power in those states and they're, and, and they're going to use it. Yeah. And to some extent, you know, conservatives do it as well. You know, Oklahoma, I, you know, <laughs> their attorney general is an awesome guy and I, you know, it resonates completely with yeah. me. But I mean, they're kind of say, yeah. Uh, and by the way, it, we're coming after you if you sell the pills. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, so, I've, I've heard some of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the you know one of the things I would just encourage uh, our folks is to is to spend some time educating yourself to the argument you mentioned Equal mm-hmm. Rights Institute and I think that's one of the best sources mm-hmm. to go to that so many of the arguments that I've been seeing play out on social media are so specious they you know things like um, um, you know there. The, the issue of you know if you haven't adopted you don't have if you don't have a womb you don't have a right if you, if you, all, all these reasons why you're trying to marginalize your ability to, to speak into this and you know none of those hold up to logical arguments it, if you apply if you apply that you know to other topics it's so interesting because I was even listening to the BBC which is you know British Broadcasting Corporation mm-hmm. and they're they're interviewing the Oklahoma Attorney General mm-hmm. and he says what was it, what makes you as a white man you yeah. know have the right to tell a woman what to do and it's just kind of like well. When when did all of a sudden we have to be you know has yeah. to, we have to have a certain skin skin color or gender to be able to speak for I mean it's just this, yeah. I don't know when that argument came into being but it's very odd to me yeah. that this is now and, and the ironic thing is that there was a woman and there was a black man who were you know on the right <laughs> side of this you know and and you know the thing that that saddens me uh, but also impresses me sometimes you wonder what's it like to be on the Supreme Court yeah what are these these people like these people are incredibly strong people they mm. knew exactly what they were signing up for yes these these are patriots. Patriots. Um, you know, even I've, because of some friendships and relations I have, I've been able to spend some time with some federal judges mm-hmm. and Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, when you talk to them, that they talk about the collegial atmosphere. It's real. It's real. I had a wonderful conversation with someone who's an Obama appointee. We don't agree on anything, but they were just genuinely nice people. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, when it comes down to making their decisions based on their legal principles and how they view the law and so forth, they're unshakable. So all these people calling Clarence Thomas, you know, Uncle Clarence, or using the N words all over Twitter, mm. where they're using the N word, usually wh- young white women again, mm. uh, which just really reveals a racism that's pathetic. But uh, you know. I stood in Clarence Thomas's office, my wife, me, and him, just the three of us. We talked. This was 15 years ago plus. Uh, but we talked about the pressures that he's under. And he has this huge booming laugh. And he just, you know, chuckled. And interesting, all along his walls were uh, editorial cartoons of his of – his, uh, um, hearings that oh, Anita Hill, he, he, yeah, wow. he ha- he has them framed and on his walls in his office, or at least did at that time. Um, and so every day when he walks in, he's reminded of what he was put through to get to his, yeah. his seat. But he had this huge booming laugh, and, ha, ha, you know, just just booming. And he said, "Dan, let me just tell you what the Supreme Court justices think about what the media says about us and what people in the general yeah. population losing their minds over." He yeah. says, "We don't give a damn." <laughs> 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 and I'll never forget it because I mean, it really was. We were talking about everything from who's going to retire next to yeah. these different things. And, you know, you have to be careful because, you you know, you, you have to respect the office. And so you don't ask a lot of intimate or personal right, questions. Right. But it's just, uh, just, Dan, you know what? We're here for life. And we, you know, we're set. <laughs> and that's so, the whole point. Right. The whole point of that office is that it's not – it's not motivated by politics. Yeah, it's politics a, it's or insulated. the masses. Yeah, and they want to. You, you know, uh, Susan Collins was pitching a hissy fit because she said, "Well, you know, they lied to me whenever." You know, first of all, it's unethical for them to say in advance how they're going to rule. Secondly, the fact that they're asking, "Where would you stand on this issue?" is not only unethical; it's political. Yeah. So if they're making decisions based on their qualifications, it's one thing. If they're make, make, making them based on how 
Are you going to align it with me politically? That's politicizing it. And that's what the founders didn't want us to do. Right. Don't, and they shouldn't put the Supreme Court justice candidates in that position. It mm. did not happen until Edward Kennedy did it for for. Bork, yeah, when, Robert, Robert Bork. Bork, whenever yeah. he was in, in 1981 or two or whenever it was that he was nominated. And from that point forward, Kennedy broke down serious walls on how Supreme Court nominees were handled. And it has turned into the circus that it is today mm. because of him. Mm. So again, I think all of us who are engaged in conversations, thoughtful conversations with people need to do our homework. We need to understand why people respond the way they do. And, and you know, it's not enough to put a meme up on your Facebook wall with a verse of scripture. I know, you know, fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. We all believe that and so forth. But that's not going to convince anybody. It's certainly not going to convince a young atheist woman. Yeah. I tell you the people it's important to have the conversation with, it's the people that live under your roof. Absolutely. Because when you send your kids to public schools, I guarantee you, when you send your kids off to college, I'll guarantee you that 99% of the messages they get from people in authority are going to be, you have a right to choose. Yeah. And if you don't counter that, teach that, explain that from a biblical sense, yes. from, from all the different you know appropriate worldviews, if you don't do that, you're going to lose the battle and you're going to one day wake up and look on your daughter's Facebook wall and she's going to be promoting the exact opposite of what you believe. Yeah, I think that's really important is that... that don't assume just because they you you bring them to church that you yeah. you you know you raise them in a quote unquote Christian home that they are going to have your values they they are going to be drinking from the water and even social media you they might even be homeschooled but if you if they're drinking the waters of TikTok and Instagram and social media they they can be heavily influenced by those things and so yeah you know, I just think it's it's one of those uh, realities that parents make sure that you are teaching your kids what what the truth is and, and that you're educating them because, um, man, the world will if you don't. I think that's really important. So I have a question for you. What, what do you do with – I know this is we, – we've had conversations about this, but immediately after this happens, you hear all the big companies, Apple, yeah. Amazon. I mean, I could list them all. They're going to pay for all their employees now yeah. to fly and it doesn't matter where they live, they're going to fly – should that register for us as Christians? I mean, I, what is that? What did that do for you when you heard that? How now it's almost like corporate activism that yeah. seems to be ramping up, especially with this issue. What What are your thoughts on that? Great question, and um, I, my view on that is a matter of individual conscience. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, my conscience. I wrote the list of those people down. Mm -hmm. I've researched it. I've updated it. And I'm actively trying to avoid, when possible, it's not always possible, but actively trying to avoid using them. Mm. Um, like, for instance, Starbucks is one of those companies. Right. I, I I was done with Starbucks before. I'm really done with them now. <laughs> I've got choices on where I can buy my coffee. I don't yeah. have to buy. I've literally had meetings in Starbucks where I sit there with a glass of water because I'm not going to spend money at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll use their Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, um, at the same time, if I need a ride share, both Lyft and Uber have said they will do it. So I don't have a choice there. Mm. Um, and, you know, I need to get to where I'm going. So, I mean, I, some people say, well, that's hypocritical. There, there's hitchhiking, Dan. Come on. <laughs> be consistent. I really love <laughs> Jesus. I'd walk. <laughs> but I, I do I – do th for me, it's a matter of, of – Two, two, two things. Uh, stewardship. Yeah. I want I want to be accountable for how I spend all my money. And, and secondly, it's my way of raging against the machine. Mm. This to me is the greater danger. What government can't do constitutionally, corporate America, corporate world is now doing on their behalf. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is what I believe, and I don't want to get too deep into the theology of the theology. But whether you're amillennial or, pre or dispensationalist or, you know, whatever position, I believe Look when you look at John's epistles, mm -hmm. but uh, particularly 1 John, mm -hmm. what you see is the Antichrist world yeah. in play. Yeah. And m there may be a person, but there's definitely a system. Absolutely. A, a person needs a system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so whether or not there is a single antichrist or not, I'll let, I'll let all the eschatology nuts, you know, debate that. What, but we can't debate whether or not there is not an anti-Christian, anti-Christ, anti-truth system. Yes. And for many years, many people thought that was going to be the government. I no longer think that. I think it's going to be the, the business, the, the fi fi financial industry, the, you know, corporate world. Yeah. And, and the same thing will have to happen. I think to Christians that happened even during the days of the guilds in the early years of the church right, yeah. is that you, you create an underground economy as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that all of these are, are things that we now, now need to think about and, and um, we're, we're navigating these waters in, in a post row world. But um, Dan, I, I just think as we 
as we end our conversation, um, I just think it's really important to understand there's a lot more work to be done. Yes. I don't, I don't think that we should rejoice in this moment, but understand it's not like we can, it's not like we're like, okay, yeah. you know, job's done. Let's, job's done. What's the next thing we're going to do? Um, <laughs> so, so I think in some ways what, what the decision of Roe versus Wade did almost 50 years ago was it almost became, it normalized abortion so that now, now that it's taken away, the majority of Americans still in some, in, at some levels think that, that abortion should be legal. Uh, now, What's interesting is most American most Americans believe that uh, abortion should be legal, but most abor- most Americans also believe that abortion shouldn't be legal after the first trimester. Yeah. So I mean, it's a very it's yeah. a very uh, you've got to break that question down yeah. a lot. Like some people say, yeah, it should be legal if the life of the mother is going to be at risk. Yeah. You know, there, there's there's a, a number, lot of nuances. Yes. Yeah, and that's what makes this so difficult. But I yeah. would say, <clears throat> you and I live in North Carolina. Yeah, North Carolina. We do not have a trigger law. We do not have a pro-life state. We're mm-hmm. a kind of a purple state, but we had the opportunity when when we had a Republican governor and mm-hmm. a Republican House and Senate, and, and they muffed it. They didn't do it. Mm-hmm. So I would say in North Carolina, we have an opportunity right now in this coming election. I think it's three House seats and one or two Senate seats, and they have a uh, – the, the – uh, Republicans have a super majority. So mm-hmm. that means they could override Anything Cooper's that, yeah. Cooper's uh, veto, and mm-hmm. he would definitely veto it. Mm-hmm. So some people were saying, well, yeah, we can't wait for two more years to get Cooper out. Well, first of all, we have a history of re- a Democrat <laughs> governor, so that's not a, yeah. that's not a you know, gimme. But you, we, we could see that if we elected the right, you know, even in Huntersville right now, we've got a big race, uh, John... Um, Bradford, I think it's Bradford, and uh, Christy Clark mm-hmm. are, are running for s- state house. Christy Clark knocked out the one, and then she got knocked out by John. Uh, John's going to be pro life. Christy is extremely hard left. So <clears throat> even in, in our own district, we have an opportunity. And I think yeah. it's really important that all of us educate ourselves on local politics because now it is local. Yeah, that's good. Well, hey, I, I, uh, I appreciate you guys uh, joining us for this conversation. You know, one of the things I would encourage you to, if you have questions, if you have thoughts or or just you're uncertain about what this really means, we, you know, Dan and I love to talk to people. I know many of you uh, share share your thoughts with us uh, on Sundays when you see us, but but don't let don't let this moment be a cloudy moment or a moment of shock to you. Um, really ask the Lord God, how, how do you want me to continue to be pro-life? Pro, pro pro Christian pro God in our nation today, and so we want to encourage you to continue to walk in the, the spirit of truth. And uh, thank you again for joining us on this episode of Life Talks. We'll talk to you next time.